the horror of an atheistic universe. Hi, how are you today? I'm fine, thanks. That life has no meaning and that there is no God to give it one. The French biochemist Jacques Monod seemed to echo these sentiments when he wrote in his work, Chance and Necessity, man finally knows that he is alone in the indifferent immensity of the universe. This is the book from which Craig quotes. I made a little competition in the last video asking you to find the words that Craig says in this book. To be honest, I wasn't entirely fair because I reread the book very carefully looking for those words and I couldn't find them. I was 99% certain that you won't find these exact words. My purpose was to encourage you to find this book and read it for yourself because it's a very good book where Jacques Monod in a natur naturalistic way explains how is it possible that in a unfeeling, indifferent universe not created by a personal being with a purpose humans appeared who very much have a purpose, a meaning, a value, and morality in their life. So, to all of you who found this book and read it, and especially to Jay Philosopher, who gives in the comment the supposed quotation that Craig gives in his lecture, only in a different words, probably it was a different translation. The words that Craig says are taken from the middle of the sentence in the last paragraph of this book. I will read the whole sentence, shall I? The ancient covenant is in pieces. Man knows at last that he is alone in the universe's unfeeling immensity, out of which he emerged only by chance. But how is it that from an unfeeling, indifferent universe, which was not created by a personal being with any meaning or purpose, the humans appeared? For a start, let's try and find a way to differenti differentiate between artificial objects and natural objects. If archaeologists digging in the earth were to come across objects shaped like arrowheads and pottery shards and tomahawk heads, they would be justified in inferring that these artifacts were not the product of sedimentation and metamorphosis, but were the products of intelligent design, even if they had no idea whatsoever who this people group was that made these artifacts and left them there. Similarly, if astronauts were to discover a pile of machinery on the backside of the moon. We think that we immediately and easily can distinguish between a natural object and an artificial object. But we recognize an artifact only in our capacity of making artifacts. This is not entirely objective. Can't there be found criteria which are objective by which we can recognize artificial object from a natural object? Then these objective criteria can be used to make a computer program that will objectively be able to differentiate between natural and artificial. The objective criteria based on the shape, the structure only, of an object should be two. A natural object, which is the result of a play of physical forces, doesn't usually have rectilinear edges or right angles or regularity or flat surface. So one of the criteria can be this one, regularity. And another criteria is repeatedness. 
Repeatedness is a very good objective criterion because multiple objects of a similar size reflect the intent in the maker for creating objects that will fulfill some function. We should state here another condition that only macroscopic objects uh, should be examined with these criteria because about one centimeter because at a microscopic level the atomic and molecular structure is regular, geometric. Suppose we have made such a computer program, what best way but to test it on terrestrial objects? Or let's imagine that some alien sentient beings have made such a, a machine with such a computer program and have visited er the Earth to see if they will find sentient life here. If this machine from some alien NASA lands on Earth near a suburb and a rock formation, it will have no difficulty by the criteria of regularity and repeatedness of judging the row of houses, the houses to be um, artificial objects and the rock formation to be a natural object. If after that it looks at smaller uh, size objects, a pebble and a crystal, for example, a pebble, it will have no difficulty in seeing it as a natural object. A crystal, though, a quartz crystal, for example, I have one in Bulgaria, but uh, here I don't have one to show you. It has a regular geometric structure, but the crystal, in the crystal, on the macroscopic level, uh, the microscopic structure is reflected. So it also is a natural object. If then this computer program looks at some other objects, for example, a hive made by wild bees, by its geographical structure it will assume that it is an artificial object. We also see it as an artificial object made by the bees, but it is not a conscious activity, it's an automatic activity by the bees. If after that the computer looks at the bees themselves, it will also ascertain, it will also see that the bees must be an artificial object as well, judging by the, their structure, the <coughs> regularity, the symmetry in their structure, lateral and uh, translational, and also the repeatedness it will see many bees exactly the same, to the smallest detail. So it would seem that there is some error in this computer program if it judges a bee which we as naturalists see as a natural object, as an artificial object. Probably this paradox arises from the fact that we have divested this program from the one characteristic which is the content of an artificial object, the, its purpose, its function. Maybe a computer program, program should be made which takes into account the function of an object as well. If we imagine that uh, this alien NASA <laughs> have, sent, have made such a computer program, and if we imagine that it now looks at two uh, different objects, for example, horses in a field and cars on the road, it will see that it has a similar function moving rapidly, although 
on different surfaces which accounts for the different structure of the objects. If it then looks at a camera, it will see its function picking up images and the eye of a vertebrate, it will see the same function picking up images. And also the structure is not very different, having diaphragm, lens and so on. We know that a camera is made with a purpose, with intent in the mind of the maker of picking up objects. And uh, the eye of the vertebrate has the same function, but it's not made. So by examining only the structure and witnessing the performance of the object, it can be decided the author, the source, of this purpose, of the intent for the function of the object. To achieve this, we must have a program which identifies not only the function, the purpose of the object, but how it was made, its history, its origin, especially how it was put together. This process, the development, is called uh, morphogenesis. It is possible for such a computer program, in principle, to be built. So if the alien NASA machine lands on Earth and uh, has such a computer program, it will be able to see that artifacts, artificial objects, are shaped by external forces, while living beings which are natural objects, <laughs> are shaped uh, through an internal process. It has nothing to do with external forces. That is why living beings are uh, self-constructing machines. Living beings are also self-reproducing -reprodu machines because <clears throat> this computer program will see that every living being is an exact reproduction of another living being, and it is the same. The fact that this structure reproduces itself unchangingly, it is one of the characteristics of the human beings, invariance. It doesn't change, it reproduces, but in the same shape, form, everything is the same. The fact that living beings are highly ordered structures and are invariably uh, reproduced the same can be judged quantitatively by the content of information, the invariance information in them, or invariance content. But now, we have to point out to another major characteristic, to the second major characteristic of living beings, and that is the characteristic, the property of teleonomy. Living beings have a purpose, a function, to survive and reproduce. And this purpose, this function, is a result of the constituents of a human being. They are made of proteins. Proteins and their ingredients, amino acid residues, have the property of stereospecificity, which is a chemical property. So these are the two strange properties of living beings, invariance and teleonomy. It is important which one of them is primary because if most uh, through history, most ideologies, religions and uh, philosophies have taken teleonomy to be the first primary characteristic. In fact, invariance is the primary characteristic and then comes teleonomy. Science has one axiom, one uh, assumed thing in its basis, 
and that is the principle of objectivity, the postulate of objectivity. It's true, it can't be defined by or measured by science itself, but it is conspecific with science. Only through objectivity, true facts can be uh, found, find, found out and uh, measured. Jacques Monod says, an exact date may be given for the discovery of the postulate of objectivity. The formulation by Galileo and Descartes of the principle of inertia laid the groundwork not only for mechanics, but for the epistemology of modern science by abolishing Aristotelian physics and cosmology. Living beings are the only objects in the known universe with uh, characteristics of teleonomy. So one can imagine the first uh, human beings looking around them they are the strange objects in the universe, but they didn't realize that. When they saw plants or animals, they didn't have any uh, problems with that, because plants grow, seek the light, spread uh, seed, and reproduce. This is a uh, purpose, sort of purpose, function. The same with animals. They look for prey, they fight a rival for a female in order to reproduce, but the first <clears throat> humans, when they saw inanimate objects, those were for them the strange objects. And they assumed that just like they and uh, other living beings, inanimate objects also have a purpose of their own, that they have uh, something like a soul. So they created some invisible beings with an intent, with some uh, purpose that have created the inanimate objects. And later, these myths developed into the religions we have today. Jacques Monod calls this animism, looking for a meaning, a purpose, where there isn't any. And many ideologies, uh, religions, and philosophies are built on animism. And then Monod says, animism established a covenant between nature and man, a profound alliance outside of which seems to stretch only terrifying solitude. But with the development of science, especially biology, it can be seen that living beings, and especially the species Homo sapiens, result of a long re evolution, are the ones that have meaning and uh, purpose and teleonomic characteristics. Life has no meaning and that there is no God to give it one. The French biochemist Jacques Monod seemed to echo these sentiments when he wrote in his work Chance and Necessity, man finally knows that he is alone in the indifferent immensity of the universe. I want to read again the sentence from the middle of which <laughs> Craig took his uh, quotation. The ancient covenant is in pieces. Man knows at last that he is alone in the universe's unfeeling immensity, out of which he emerged only by chance. And he goes further. His destiny is nowhere spelled out, nor is his duty. He has to decide for himself. <laughs>